live from the FIA Barcelona Gran Via Conference Center in Barcelona, Spain. It's The Cube at HP Discover Barcelona 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, HP. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Barcelona, Spain for HP Discover 2014, the European edition. Uh, we were in Las Vegas earlier this year for HP Discover in North America. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. We talk to the execs, we talk to the product managers, we talk to the geeks, entrepreneurs, CTOs, and uh, we had a great segment here uh, as we wrap up day three, getting down to the wire, day three of three days of coverage. Uh, we got Fernando Lucchini, CTO of Big Data, and Chris Goodfellow, CTO of Idle On Demand. Basically the tech guys, the entrepreneurs who invented the product here inside theCUBE, so great to have you guys. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. No, Good to be here, thank you. Um, so, Fernando, we were just talking before we came on, we're totally geeking out on CrowdChat, yes. the data, the idle on demand, so much good stuff going on. Um, under, the, under the hood, um, some stuff's trivial, some stuff is not. Um, before we get into some of the things around idle on, haven on demand and idle on demand, what, share with the folks out there, just some of the complexities of, that goes on in big data. I mean, like, it sounds easy, but it's not, this magic that happens, what's yeah. some of the tech going on, how hard is it? It's, it's hard, but it, hard is a bad word, right? We're trying to simplify something that's actually quite fun for everyone. But so, a, a good example of this is as as we, so we're a company that deal with information, right? We we dream information, we work with information, we look at these problems, we look at video, voice, um, and uh, and some of it is harder than others. So the image recognition is tough stuff. You know, you're looking at something that is even difficult to interpret with your eye, let alone with a machine, right? Um, then we have all the tech stuff that has such richness and context is magic. I don't see it as difficult, I just see it as rich. Well, first of all, geeks love this stuff because it's a geek uh, dream, right? There's a lot of stuff to get your hands on. One of the things that we talk about uh, all the time on theCUBE is, around big data, is the diversity of, of geekness. I mean, yes. there's machine learning, there's data science, there's large scale systems. Talk about that for a minute. What are you seeing as a spectrum of skill sets and challenge areas in big data from an engineering standpoint and from a development standpoint? So the, the variety thing is important, and we should spend a second on that, right? So. Um, variety historically has been a barrier to try and get things done, right? So if you have to worry about uh, all the specialist knowledge and hardware that you need to deal with video, or all the specialist knowledge you have to deal with voice or text, it becomes a, a, a barrier for you to achieve what you want to do, which ultimately is do something amazing with that thing, right? Um, so what I think is definitely changing, and, and we're changing at HP for sure, is, is making much of this very approachable. Now it just requires for you to have a great idea. It just requires for you to know that you want to use video and, and understand that uh, the, you know, the outcomes. And then it just takes the execution has become easier. So if you need to consume, and I, I use simple examples, right? So we've got customers. I was talking to somebody not so long ago. One of our customers who processes about two billion documents a year. I mean, these are human beings processing information. And we did the math on that, and, and it would take like 200 people, 24 years to read this data, right? And they do this with 50 people, right, a year. Yeah, yeah. So these guys don't want to know how much you know, hardware they throw at it, or they want to just do it. And I think that's what's really changed. Now it's about, what do you want to do? X, Y, and Z. Well, well computation is certainly awesome. I mean, you can spin up now with cloud, computation clusters on at will. Oh, yeah. And just boom. Oh, we do it all the time. We plug, press the button on Helion and we get ourselves a thousand nodes and we're off to the races just like that. Do you get special keys to the kingdom with Helion? Come on, <laughs> tell the truth. Wow. <laughs> Not special keys to the kingdom, okay. but we're brothers we and sisters. We want that, yeah. We're brothers and sisters yeah, and we yeah. you get special <laughs> backdoor access, family no, pass. No, nothing, yeah. like, nothing <laughs> like that. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. But but it's there. I mean that, that to your question, that's what's there now. So if I want to create a business which requires to process large amount of data and I just want to have that computer, I press the button, the computer's there, I get on with my life. Right? It's super exciting and, and um, you know, Chris, I want to get you in here because Idle On Demand is free and you can people can try it out. Um, but it's a fun time right now to be in big data, be a, a geek and coding away because there's so much action happening. I mean, when you guys did the product, I mean, you small team, talk about the process. What, what, what did you guys do? You guys sit and just whiteboard it out? Did you back of the napkin? How did this all come together? Well, as you say, I mean, it, it's an exciting time. We, we've been I mean, we've been doing big data for, for years. I mean, what, what everyone is now talking about, I mean, we, we've been building systems that index millions of emails or billions of emails um, for a long time. But what 
what we did with Iron on Demand is we realised that we could take that powerful technology and get it out into the hands of everybody, the developer in their bedroom, the, the, the developer who's been given a small project that, okay, perhaps he doesn't have the funding to go and set up a server farm and, and all that. So it was really about opening that up. So what we really did is we, we sat down and started to work out, okay, how, how do I make this available to a developer? And we, we went through the process of, of getting things out there as soon as possible. I mean, so from project kickoff to our first release was literally just three months. So we could get it out there. We could start talking to developers, um, start going to, to developer events, hackathons, and getting it into the hands and start to work that out. Um, now, at the same time, we had to, in, in the back end, as you were saying, that there's some interesting problems here. Um, we, we've solved a lot of the functionality pieces um, for, through kind of what we've been used to. Um, so we've got a lot of experts in know how to handle image, know how to handle video, extract the meaning out of text. But obviously, building something on demand where you're, you are dealing with hyperscale volumes, knowing how to scale, a lot of interesting problems there, knowing how to protect yourself, um, enforce quotas, ensure that fairness of service, um, things that are very much uh, part of the modern cloud era. So I got to ask you guys here, got a question on our CrowdChat, go to crowdchat.net slash HPDiscover, our big data app, it's about an engagement container, of course we were just showing you the big mm -hmm. data stuff. A uh, question came in from the Crowdfather, uh, one of our anonymous handles. Crowdfather. The Crowdfather, yes. not to be confused with the Crowd <laughs> Captain, and the Crowd Doctor, and then there's yeah, the Crowd yeah, yeah. Business, this character. Crowd Exec, the Crowd mm -hmm. Guy. So the Crowd Cap, uh, Crowdfather would like to know, um, what about the, the evolution of reasoning? This, you know, yep. Watson at IBM is certainly here. He's, he's, he's got the machine as their, their yep. shiny object. Meta reasoning, meta data, the role of, of data, active data, passive yep. data, reasoning. As geeks, how do you guys look at that? What are you guys doing? What's the hot area yep. around reasoning? Because that's an area to simplify. You can, if you can reason, you get some personalization, yeah, yeah, yeah. collective intelligence, role yeah. of the crowd. Well, there's plenty to choose from. Um, and I know we've got the Watsons on one side, we're doing a great job of, 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 of promoting the, the idea of, of something intractable and untouchable, yeah. but um, the, we've been working on what we call meaning-based computing for 10 years. And the principle hasn't changed that much, which is, it's the user that has changed. The principle was that um, the human information is something that we, we humans understand because it's based on context. So for, for us here geeking out on technology, somebody who's in our world can sit in front of this recording and say, I get these guys because I know the context. But my wife can sit there and look at us like we're mad because she's context-less, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today this is still the case. So today reasoning is all about the context of information, but more and more it's understood by the, the guy with his phone is the mini analyst. He can see information and demands that there's context, right? And interact with it. Correct. The other part of this is the whole question and answer thing, the conversational software, right? So we all want to talk to our phone and get an answer. We never get the right answer, but we get an answer. Yeah. We all demand that. So what I think is going to be very interesting, and Chris can chip in as well, is that the evolution is demand driven. So now we as consumers are demanding that machines understand or applications, in mean, your application which we were having a look at, it's very interesting. We demand these things speak yeah. to us and do yeah. something more useful to us than just give us things. So what we're obsessed about in the in the big data division is um, is of course the back-end tools that allow us to shift information into trillions of objects and all that jazz, right? Understanding the data in whichever you know, size, volume and variety. But we're really obsessed about how is it going to be delivered to this end user who is demanding that it does more for them. Yeah. Um, and, and there is where, you know, I think everybody has to do a lot of work. Watson has some work to do, we have work to do. Well, you nailed it. I think this demand interaction is interesting. This is where real time comes in because mm. when Dave was here, Dave would be like all over this. Because we talk about real time. What does that mean? If you're crossing the street and you get hit by a taxi, certainly in Barcelona, you might. But, um, yeah. That's if you're like off by a second. If you're getting bad data and you walk out in the middle of the street, you're dead, right? Uh -huh. So real time is interesting. Yeah. So near real time, real time, that's a big part of this. The eyes of the beholder, right? So you're the consumer. You got the phone. You didn't get that answer when you wanted it. Is it real time? It doesn't matter whether it's real time or not. It's not right for me. And it's that's... the context. You nailed it. I love that. So let's right. drill down on that. So what does that mean to businesses? So obviously there's a spectrum yep. of demand on real time. Yep. So that's why near real time, if it's good enough, it's close, you know, you can talk about a grenade or yeah. uh, you know a bomb. It's close enough, yeah, okay, yeah, still yeah. kills the target. Uh, that's my old analogy. But when it comes down to, to the, the actual platforms, um, what is the pattern right now that you guys see? From a, from a current state of the art, because um, you got visualization, visualization is cool. Around the real time and, and in, through the BI, this is a new, the new market. Yeah. What are some of the state of the art things that you guys see yeah. that, have, that have crossed the chasm in customer minds? Like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. I don't 
don't think we still know the answers to, or, the, or even the questions half of the time. So if you take real time as part of that problem, right? Yeah. We all want real time in the sense that I think we all want instant gratification, right? We all want the answer now. But we, in again, I'd love to see, hear you both of you on this, but it feels that we don't in many cases know the, the question to, to begin with. So we're in a bit of that strange place. For real time stuff, I think more than real time, what businesses want is that they want to create this year 10 applications on their data as real time as possible, whereas last year they were building one in the whole year. I think the demand is I want to create five apps on my data because my data is rich and has all the value, and I want to do it be, be it as fresh as possible because the value of the information is lower and lower and lower and lower, right? So the, the time value of the information. And, um, and that's what they're demanding. So these things, the on demand platforms, the pay as you go platforms, the REST based functions where everything is the pure value and not the geekiness of how the face recognition works. That's where these things come in, because you're telling the guy that's sitting in his in his bedroom or in a company, hey, I'm gonna do all the heavy lifting for you. You just have the idea. And we've got some, Chris can talk to a couple of our great examples of people creating uh, apps. We can talk about Sparky for a bit. Oh, have so a go let's, at that. Let's, let's capture that point, because I just made a note of that on the, on the crowd chat was, was one, the app evolution oh, yeah. is going to be data driven. So a data fabric as a development kit, yeah. data as a development tool, is a new concept, and then not to us, but to you guys. Yeah, yeah. Not to you guys, but to the world. Yeah, oh, I can yeah. actually program with data um, as an input. Uh, and two, the um, third party developer. This comes into more of a development platform. So oh, yeah. when Robert Young Johns was on last year, we asked him that direct question, yeah. what's your development strategy? Because that's huge, right? Yeah. If you can enable yeah. people to build apps. So can you guys talk about that? What's your experience just in the industry with the data and your platform? Yeah. Is it the customer's going to build the apps? Because certainly I agree with you. I think apps is going to be a tsunami of apps at some point once they get over the virtual uh, visualization piece. Uh, um, well, Chris, you build, I mean, you build the developer platforms. So, yeah, I mean, you, you talk about real time. In many ways, it's not just the real time of being able to ask the query. It's the real time of being able to change what I'm asking. So being able to, to get the business to the point where I no longer have to have a six month project to, to introduce a new application or introduce a new project. We've had some great examples where we've had both enterprises and, and indie developers out there developing some great applications over the course of 24, 48 hours and starting to ask new questions and being able to evolve much more quickly than the traditional model of, of, of kind of being few months behind. So your, your business is, is real time, not necessarily in the sense that it returns the answer in 10 milliseconds, which we do have a few customers doing, but, yeah. but more that, okay, I, need, I know I need to do something new, mm. I can do that in a week or two weeks yeah. rather than, than in, in three months. So yeah. we've got some great examples, whether it's um, a Mexican startup who within two weeks had, had built an application to do um, social media monitoring for parents and started presenting it to VCs to get funding. How good something is that, right? So we're looking whether our kids are being, uh, being bullied in Facebook. Come yeah, on, yeah. and you want to you want to kill that fast if it's not going to be a business, or you want to push it if it's going to be a business. Yes. But you don't want to waste six months coding to yeah, figure yeah. that out. You want to get it out in the two weeks and see if it's got traction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the it's the show me now. Now it's the business, and I think bosses in enterprise are going to turn around and say, um, "I've had a great idea, which is so and so. I'm going to take yeah. this data and make it stand." And they're going to say, "Show me, show me." Yeah, I just wrote a post on this on Forbes we'll called the Marketing Cloud evaluating Oracle and they actually have a good, that's not fully there yet, but what you guys are doing is the same thing, which is, I totally agree, this notion of upfront licenses is gone. I mean, it's going to be like, show me, I'll do a little buy here, I'll taste, and if I don't like it, I'm not buying, but show, okay, if I like it, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take more of that, right? Yeah, you go back I buy the drink, exactly. whatever you want to call it, I mean, it you is show it, you go back and say, it wasn't a philosophy, I've actually tried it out, the technology, I've created a little UI, which I can show the principle, yeah. and off I go. Well, I mean, there's, I a, there's a CIO telling us the other day that he's changed his RFP process, so it now includes a hackathon. So they run a hackathon for 48 hours with the, <clears throat> pardon me, with the software and, and see what you can produce in 48 hours. And it's, he says it, it tells you so much more than the traditional process. We should process. talk about hackathons, because for us it's been, I mean, we come from enterprise world, right? We sell enterprise tools, yeah. and we find ourselves in the place where we're thinking, actually, if you open up the kimono, right, and you open up the tools and you put them out there, and you ask customers, you know, spend 24 hours with your people, and they just, rather than just sitting in a room idealizing and <laughs> doing things and walls, um, actually just use the platform to have some, you know, get the ideas going. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. the outcome of that is? Applications. Yeah, and also loyalty. People, it's like, it's like, cars. When you drive a good car, you're like, I like this car, right? I and like this topic of cars. Let's continue with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, this is, but this is what it's like. I mean, this idea of locking, grabbing by yeah. the throat, the old lead gen, you know, like, oh, here's a six-month migration path and a million-dollar upfront license. Yeah. 
and the market's moving too fast. And I, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. I think the SaaS thing's interesting. I want to get your take on this because I have a lot of tech friends like you guys that are out there, and we're doing the same thing. Where yeah. SaaS is a, the ultimate iteration DevOps for yeah. entrepreneurship. You can put something out there fast and yeah. get instant feedback, yep. and then iterate quickly. You know, agile, lean stuff, whatever you want to call it. But most uh, entrepreneurs don't actually go out and do the SaaS business model in parallel. Meaning, if your iteration cycles on the tech is fast, you have to understand that it's a land and expand business model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which means if you do land and have to expand, you got to think that out. So if you do get successful, I see what you're saying. So I see a lot of guys that still where I live. It's like, dude, you have a land and expand leverage model that if you do land and grow, you got lightning in a bottle, you got a rocket ship. So mm. what's your customer acquisition cost? I don't know how to, what would I sell it? Uh, yes, but didn't, don't sales. you see the opposite model as well, where you have a, the, old, the old problem we have, if you and I created a problem like you guys have created, right? And you've got an element in the old world of you've got IP that sits in the back to solve the problem, heavy lifting problems, and you have a delivery part where you're creating something the user might want to touch, right? Um, what these guys are seeing now, is they don't have to worry about the creating the IP side. So you remove the entire part of your delivery and how you yes. can expand it. The only thing you got to do is say, look, I'm going to create the UI, which is compelling. You know, the average uh, gal or chap that's going to use it is going to love it. Oh, I've got a thousand users. I start paying. I don't have to worry about uh, I think creating IP. Well, I think this, that's a huge point. So here's my take on that, right? So there's two levels of land grabbing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the more IP you build that does heavy lifting, if it's good heavy lifting that has a market, you'll do make more profits. Yes. But what you're bringing up is, the, is, on my belief, the monetization of the, the first, a real new monetization opportunity for developers. And that yeah. is, if you're do, like your platform does a lot of heavy lifting, yeah. if, you could, if I'm an entrepreneur, I could shed that off, I'm essentially a reseller partner, in a way. So if you take the old business model yeah. concept, what is a reseller? They're front ending, someone else, that yeah. HP has resellers selling gear. So the developer model is interesting. I can be an expert at a UI or an interaction experience, whether it's voice, you know, drones or something else, and provide real value that is not, that is worth potentially a very well, big business. Let me give you something that blows my mind, which is that, um, so we look at our on-demand platform, right? And on-demand platform is all about, not only about the heavy lifting that we do, all the stuff we do with structured data and human information, video voice, it's not only about what we do there. So one of our philosophies is to be able to give our partners, our developer community, everyone, the ability to expand that platform. So find yourself in a situation where you look at the 50 APIs that we provide today as well as the, the SQL access, right? And you as a developer can say, actually, I, I've written a bit of technology that is core IP, and I want to surface it through you as a, as a bit of functionality, as a rest. It's not a marketplace, I just, I want to use it together with your stuff. Yeah, I think you said- That's where we're going, where it's going to be, hey, if you've got something valuable, add well, it to the Well, you, we were talking before you came out, well, before we went on, about what we're doing, and my, my pragmatic view is simply this, and you, you, you said it, Fernando, use case. Mm -hmm. The business innovation actually is IP, right? Some people patent right. processes. I mean, hell, Amazon patented one click. I mean, who, who let that happen? I mean, come yes. on, one yes. click, everyone <laughs> clicks once. <laughs> it's not really a unique idea. But they, they branded it, they trademarked it. But there's little innovations like that that I think are going to be huge. And, and just this data world is so big. Like just your command center stuff, the haven on demand. So I just think it's really early. I think we're going to look back at this time and say, "Hey, remember when we had one app on big data?" Yeah. And now and the business innovation is so critical. So what is blowing my mind is we create all these amazing backend systems that do heavy lifting. We provide the platform, right? And then all these guys come so come along. And every time we do a hackathon, you look at the the ideas of people, and you sit think, you sit there, you can't make this stuff up. Because back to your car analogy, you know, the car manufacturers build mules, right? which is some strange looking thing that has yeah, different yeah. wheels and you know an engine thing popping out the top. These guys are building like, a real car, it's just not very polished. Yeah, yeah, and I the agree. use case is amazing. They're making boat cars, right? They're doing all these things that you wouldn't have thought. So what's going on with you guys? Tell us the story about how you guys started the product, um, how it all came together, some of the challenges, things you've learned. Um, well, I can, I can start a little bit and you take it over, because I'll, I'll plug it in where he starts, right? So we were, when, Robert uh, Young, so you know, right? Robert uh, joined us um, whenever that was. Robert came and said, look, I, I've got a dream that the world is going to consume information through services, and we're looking, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that, we, sounds like yeah. A, that sounds like a, that sounds like a, like We're on board with that, yeah. Yeah, we, we get that. Um, and he, he literally said, guys, why don't you build me, take some of the you know, some of the cool functionality of Idle, for example, take give uh, face recognition, or I can't remember what, you, you probably know this, 
give me a couple of these functions just to have a play. So suddenly we find ourselves with a couple of functions. That was the first, dude. And then we containers start. And I'm going to let you take over from there. God, I love containers. It's, suddenly it's a, oh, a brand God, new concept. What do we do with this? So, what ahead. did we do with this? So, I mean, the big problem we had is, is, is just where did we start? There's so much technology we have in, in the Haven platform. Do I want to do NPR? Do I want to do face detection? Do I want to do conceptual search? Do I want to do... It was... It was where did we start? Um, so one thing we realized quite early on is we needed to build a platform that allowed us to basically democratize people adding in those extra pieces. So we could say, okay, image experts, you add in your pieces, and here's just the framework we're going to deliver it through. For onboarding new tech? Yeah, for onboarding new okay. tech, and exactly. scaling it, and all. Okay. So, so, so we built a platform that took care of us handling, okay, who's, who's coming in? What do they have access to? Am I going to allow them to do this? Mm. Are they able to pay? Do I have quotas? Do I, how do I distribute the data? Um, and we've basically got a framework which we call workers, or, or kind of like little containers where the, the image teams, the, the experts who know how to get that, that face out of that image can concentrate on building their piece and packaging it up and delivering it in a standard format so we can then just expose it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what's allowed us to do this pretty much yeah, so in you basically time. built the Docker model internally for yourselves. Yes, Docker I mean, now is all, all over the place. But for us, yeah. here's Containers the have been around. Pat Gelsinger's like, Pat Gelsinger. Oh, yeah, we look back at Linux, that's right, at, 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 at some of the Unix products and containers and some of the, us old timers yeah. go, oh, yeah, Rapper, see, container, done that, right? whatever you want to call it. So we, we found ourselves using OpenStack, of course, and, and Helium a little bit later. And um, we thought to ourselves, this whole container thing sounds like fun, but I tell you what, we kind of need them to talk to each other because we, in data, you have you start doing some analysis here and you pass it on to this and you do some outcome here. And, and all these things need to talk to each other. So we, we found ourselves creating this worker fabric, which is, uh, is I think it's where it gets, sorry. So at, at that point, I think that is when on demand is born. On demand is born the moment that we don't have a few REST functions for some servers and we have a worker fabric where these things talk to each so other. So you got some persistence. Some persistence versus non persistent, you don't care? Persistence, we have communication. I mean, if say, say I want to build something on social media and I'm, I'm getting 100 tweets a second. I, I can't be doing that in an inefficient way. I need to pass that data. Perhaps I want to do entity extraction. Then I want to index it. Perhaps I want to do some notification. The data's got to flow through the platform. It's got to know where to go. Yeah. Um, it, it's basically... So it's a it's bus. Like, it, you got to build that bus. you got to build like a sort of bus for, yeah. for containers, right? So you've got this yeah, yeah, bus yeah. for containers that moves the data around. Some data it. motherboard. <laughs> the data motherboard. The That's a good way. I gotta I, I, print that I out. Know, take a note. The data motherboard. <laughs> I mean, you have people talking to each other. You got a backbone. You got a backplane. You got to connect it. And we don't do it once. This is something that anybody can go out there and say, "I'll go. I'm going to use ten of your APIs." And I don't. I don't care how you do it, but these things need to talk to each other because yeah, yeah. that's the demand. Right? A little policy in there. You got to break. Whatever support. it is, whatever combination. So that's what ends up being on demand. As well, we have our vertical on demand as well. And there, the problem is complex as well. Is how do you how do you have a, a warehouse in the cloud that can do everything that we can do at a scale that we can do, right? So what about th what about developers? What are you guys doing right now? So I mean, not this is not a business question, but more like technical question. I said, is the focus on developers? This is for them. This is for developers. Mm -hmm. On demand is for developers. Whereas Vertica uh, on demand is obviously our warehouse product. The idle on demand piece is it's for developers. If you go to the to the site, I'll put a plug in there: www.idleondemand.com. Um, Idleondemand.com. Idleondemand.com. Okay. In uh, it's purely for developers. It's something that they can immediately get a login, immediately start looking at a community, immediately start playing with the functions, do tries. They can create an application. I mean, and it's as simple as that. But the focus when you have a go and you're putting it on your screen there is you'll immediately be able to see that it is built for developers. Uh, it, there's no marketing, no, no I'm going to say no BS, right? Yeah. As, they, as they would say, right? Yeah. No, no executive yeah, speech. Sign no up right there. No marketing button. speech. Beep. Um, sign up. View the APIs. Here's the parameters. And, that. and it's also about building a community for those developers. So having the forums for them to connect to each other, having. Um, competitions for, for them to compete against each other, ways to promote their application. So we basically want to, at this point, we want to hear what they're doing, we want to hear their feedback, yeah. um, and, and we want to, if they've got a great idea, we, we'd love to hear it and we'd love to We're obsessive it. about net promoters, so everything we do is net promoter. We're also obsessed about being honest and we put things out there and sometimes we even say, we'll say we're putting this functionality out there, it's kind of half-baked, we might break it, but tell us if you like it yeah, and yeah. then we'll kind of 
pushing yeah. through. So I mean, open source has cleared the way for the new model for software development, and that's collaborative, open, out in the open. The minute you got to start body swerving and head head faking, you're dead. Well, we do open I source mean, a bunch of this stuff, by the yeah. way. So some of the UIs we just open source. Yeah, the it's, work it's our about, infrastructure. It's about will transparent open value, right? If you have a platform, nice. you know, people want trust. They want credibility. They want to know that you're going to be around, right? Uh, they don't want to waste their time on a platform that, that's not sexy or cool. And Amazon's cool today, and you know HP's working on being cool. HP's Helium. cool, man. HP Helium. What's well, wrong with you? HP's wonderful yeah. and cool. No, but we, we, oh, of course. We want them to know that HP is 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 going to take all this amazing functionality, serve them. We're going to be here. We're going to be here. You know, in the yeah. next ten years, twenty years. We're HP's gonna be not here. going away. So they can rely and build their business on it. That's all we want. I talk, to the IBM, I talk to the IBM Bluemix guys, I say, I say the same thing, guys. I don't hear engineers saying, oh man, I can't wait to up and blood my app to Bluemix. Just, it's not, just, that's not the vibe, you got to yeah. earn it. You have yeah. to earn the respect. We all have to earn our stripes. you got to earn the stripes, earn the respect. And I said, mm -hmm. I said, it's definitely doable, why not? If you have distribution, yeah. IBM does, right? You guys have We do as well. You have technology you're sharing, right? right? So the gifts are all about, it's about the gifts. Save time, make a good environment, cool the people. The premium is there, they can you know get on with it, the transparency is there, yeah. you know, they can yeah. engage for themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. You guys have a good group. I'm very impressed with uh, Robert Young Johns. I've seen George Kadifa, big fan of him, he's now doing some other special projects. You know, Chris Selland over there at Big Data, yeah. you guys are doing great work. Always been a big fan, I like to see that action happening. Um, but I want to give you guys the final uh, word on culture. Yep. Share with the people out there, um, one of my favorite questions, what's the culture like? You guys are cool, you're super geeky, but you're, you're polished. Yeah. What's it like? What's it like inside the culture? What do you guys do? What do you guys stand for? What you know? What kind of people do you hire? Uh, what do you guys do for fun? Uh, share with the folks out there what's, what's I'll, inside. I'll, I'll have a go. So, I mean, we're the, we're the kind of place where you build things like idle on demand and vertical on demand. We create new stuff, but we understand the, the legacy of what we do and the importance on our customer base. It's a fun place. We're very relaxed. Um, we like uh, we like people that are creative and smart. Uh, you know, I wouldn't categorize it in any way, you know, the top, the bottom. It's yeah. people that are smart, that like to create, that have uh, respect for customers, we're very, very customer focused. Uh, but we're good fun. And you guys solve hard problems. And then we're, we're smart, we wear jeans and... Yeah. You know, and, and the big mothership and behind jackets. you, the aircraft carrier, as Martin Miko said. But really, to me, I think the challenge has always been, whether you talk to any engineer, it's always about having fun, solving big problems, right? Absolutely. And really being relevant. You know, that to me is like, and you got all the action in front of you. You guys, yeah. are, like I said, the facial recognition and some of the confidential stuff you told me about uh, yeah. uh, operationally is fantastic. Right. It's great, great. Well, guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE. This has been a CTO uh, conversation here inside theCUBE. Uh, it's been great talking big data. I love it. I could do another hour of it. Uh, now it's going to get ready to wrap down day three. We'll be right back. This is theCUBE live in Barcelona. I'm John Furrier. We'll be right back after this short break.